Welcome to the Glamorous Podcast, a space centering the refined, cultured, and connected Black American woman. Thanks so much for joining me today. Let's get into it. wrong with older black women you know i seen a picture today of an older black woman in south carolina looking up to joe biden just a skinning and grinning and just like she was in love and i was just disturbed i was disturbed and i just don't get it now this has been an ongoing conversation amongst black people um somewhat i wouldn't say it's a a age divide but especially a lot of us millennials are starting to question like what is going on with black older black people um but before i get into that please do like the video and subscribe to the channel Um, And if you hear a lot of background noise, I am in California and it is windy and we're in the middle of like a rainstorm, but I am safe. Don't worry. So I am safe. So I want to discuss why older black people, but older black women primarily vote for Joe Biden and vote for the democrats like this has been a mystery you know it sometimes starts to get really um insulting you know when we're talking about our elders especially in this online space of the internet's making you know fun of them as if they're stupid or you know making like old slave references so i really don't want to be disrespectful i want to have more of a um insightful discussion of what is really going on here? You know, as I was looking at the picture um, of the older black lady looking up to Joe Biden, it had came to me what the issue is. And I've deduced it to two main things. Number one, a lot of older people believe that there are some good white folks that can get a prayer through. You know, like back in the day since well not back well yeah back in the day since we've really been in this condition that we're in there has been one or two white people that may not be as horrible to you as other white people they may have a little pity on you you know maybe get you a job or maybe let you you know pick some fruit off their tree so you can eat some sort of seemingly kind thing now these white people these are white people pale whites um pale white united states persons um these people typically had some sort of a like christian background so they felt like it was their christian duty to help the 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 negroes (laughs) the people that they felt less than them not that they believe that they were equal they were still Um, anti-black racist and terrorist especially regarding microaggression but they did feel like it was their christian duty to not let them you know completely starve and of course another part of that is that these white people know the true identity of these black people and so these black these white people would come through every now and again and do something nice so when you're dealing with the baby boomers and the generation before, I think they're called the silent generation, they grew up under that. You know, if you can have a rapport with a white person, you know, that won't just completely disrespect you. And it could be just something trivial. Like I've seen this at the grocery store. Like, you know, we all looking at the produce and it'll be like an older black person, like an older black man and a white man will be, you know, say something about the fruit. And he just, oh my God you're talking to me yeah and he just gets so perked up thank you it's just and I'm just like what is going on but a part of survival sometimes has been with these people you know if you can find one as we say in our community you know it's good to have some good white folks in your your pocket so the democratic party you know, because especially when dealing in the South, the Republicans, the white Republicans in the South or just the Republican Party generally are extremely stingy and they have made policies to really undermine black Southerners. And it's very staunch lines. You know, I'm in California, so, you know, I see the Democrats differently, but I understand that the Democratic Party 
those um, moderates and white liberals, they will give you a crumb of bread. You know, the Republicans in the South will let you starve, poison your water, and drink it in your face. The Democrats will give you, you know, the bread is yours. You worked and earned it. <laughs> but they're like, I'm going to give you a crumb, and then you got to fight with everybody else who come in here for that loaf. And to them, that's better. Those are the good white folks. So a lot of these older black people remember a time when white people were disrespecting them to their face especially the silent generation you know they grew up in the time you know of the Jim Crow laws and signs everywhere and the dehumanizing indecency and so when now that they're in a position you know especially once the anti-poverty bills were passed in 1964 which really is what made a lot of black people switch to the democratic party Black people have been voting Democrat ever since. At least you got a little something. You got, really, it was more poverty maintenance. I'm going to give you just enough not to starve, which is what the Democratic Party did. But I'm never going to give you enough to actually help you escape your situation. Um, unless you were that first group of people in the 60s who took advantage of those anti-poverty programs such as food stamps or subsidized housing, the free education programs, and you were able to um, maybe be the first person in your family to graduate from college and you were able to be upwardly mobile. Now that little window happened for a brief minute because we know with the anti-poverty bills came the immigration bills which opened our borders up immensely and we know that the republicans in the 1980s <laughs> opened up the borders again which is where we got a huge portion of our hispanic um people who are living in north america now so these people the silent generation the baby boomers they went through that they remember when the democrats did give them um an opening so that would be reason number one why older women vote for the Democratic Party and probably will be supporting Joe Biden. The They remember the indecency. Not that a lot of these, the white Republicans and white people was snatching them off the streets. Because when you talk, especially the baby boomers, we talk about like, okay, what white person really just put you out of sorts, just physically violated you, beat you down and stopped you? A lot of it, you know, was, you know, more of systemic or they shamed me. And a lot of the reasons why our people were shamed is because they were hoping that these people um, would be more kind and human and that it was a disappointment. And also we have to be honest, you know, with the propaganda that was out, a lot of our people felt like white people were superior. So you wanted their validation. You wanted to socially integrate um, because being next to them or whatever they were doing is the right thing to do. So when these moments of indecency happen, you know, the heartbrokenness that happened to our people, the humiliation, you know, it really took people out of sorts. So a lot of what the baby boomers experienced was psychological and of course institutional, you know, when you go get a loan, you got the racist, you know, anti-black racist white person who, you know, <laughs> is going to sit and do your underwriting extra heavy or being denied certain things. So those things all exist, but they also exist in the Democratic Party. But in these people's eyes, our people's older black women's eyes, the Republican Party, you know, is going to bring them back to, you know, I don't know, the 50s, the 60s. And, you know, that's just where they are. So to them, the Democratic Party is like good white folks. We know that they're racist, but they gave us a little something. So we just got to hold on. There's absolutely no trust. And like I said, especially when you get into the South, it's like very, very staunch. So I definitely have understanding, you know, being in California, I've been to the South. I've been to various places in the South and it is very, very different. And then Republicans out there are definitely, um, as far as resources, uh, they're very stingy more politically because actually the white people I've seen in the South, they kind of stay much, pretty much to themselves. They were friendly. They were like, okay, hi, bye. And, you know, kept it moving. But when it comes to resources and I've seen the policies, absolutely not. So, 
you know, when you see the picture of the old black woman, she has fine looking up at the white man, just the grinning. This is healing for her because all her life she wanted his validation. He is the grand poobah of the universe. And if he validates me and accepts me and smiles at me, yay, that's all I wanted. <laughs> And so a lot of our people are still seeking that. Now, the younger generations, um, you know, I'm a millennial. I'm in my 30s. I don't see it that way. You know, um, a little bit about me. You know, I grew up amongst the white people. And so they've been demystified to me very early on. I'm not looking for their validation. I, I see what they are. I understand how they got to where they are in the various opportunities. So I don't need you to smile at me, like me, or really do anything for me. And it's not just white people. That's just anyone in general. Like I'm already validated and affirmed. And, you know, we have to thank, you know, all previous generations, including the silent generation, the baby boomers and Gen X. And those who came before because they worked to build that self-esteem and now we've achieved it. So we now have to move on um, and start to get serious about this whole good white folks thing and us really trying to hold on to the crumbs when we need bread right now. We need bread and we need water and we're entitled to it. So... That would be the end of reason number one. Now, moving on to number two. Now, this is more pertaining to the baby boomer, boomer generations. The second reason why older women vote for the Democratic Party is because the Democratic Party has been a solution for their failures. Disclaimer, you're probably not going to like what I'm about to say. This will be triggering, especially if you are an older black woman. This is going to be triggering if you are a womanist, a feminist, or if you are, you know, on this, the white supremacy and the white man, you are about to be very triggered. But before you get triggered, this is just a reminder that you are listening to the Glamorous Podcast, where we center the refined culture and connected black American woman. So please do like the video and make sure you subscribe and do share the video. And when you, if you are thinking, make sure that you leave a comment below if it's something that comes to mind and you like, oh, girl, wait a minute. Or you like, you know what? Thank you. I learned something. Now, the baby boomer generation has to be honest. Under their, their time, <laughs> we had a, an epidemic of unwed teenage parents and a lot of the baby boomers coming up came up during a time of disinvestment especially if you were in the inner city or I mean really anywhere because the south was struggling has been struggling since you know after the emancipation of the slaves I mean since we've been free they I mean they really haven't bounced back but the inner cities um, the urban ghettos, you know, big cities, they definitely um, suffered. So you had that, plus you had a rise of unwed teenage pregnancies because during that time, some people did get married as teenagers and started a family, but you had a big, 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 big epidemic um, of that. And then as those people, the mothers and the fathers, because I don't really talk about, you know, the rise of single mothers. To me, it's single mothers and absentee fathers, okay? Now, as these children who are growing up in the, probably the late 60s, in the 70s, started to become of age, we had, of course, we know the crack epidemic, where, you know, drugs was a, a way, selling drugs was a way for people to get quick money while poisoning your community. And in order to maintain or protect your turf and whatever you were doing, you know, we had the influx of guns, which mysteriously came from somewhere. Um, we now know it came from the government, <laughs> placed in our communities, as well as the drugs. And so people men particularly started shooting one another we you know we also had an influx of caribbean immigrants who we now know um, were a part of facilitating that drug trade so there was a lot of chaos with newcomers they're trying to assert themselves they are working with the federal government to bring the drugs in they have the guns and then we have the pr men who were here younger men coming of age you know, with this investment in economic hardship, 
you know, turned to that to make some money. Um, then you had the rise of a lot of the, the gang culture, people, you know, when you have fatherlessness, you have young men, they look for family in a sense, and you look for protection because man's survival, the man's survival is based on the group. Women can do it solo, but men survive based on being in groups. So gangs became very attractive. And, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, it was like, oh my God, the 80s and the 90s, what the hell was that? Like, I still can't believe I survived it. It was so crazy, and I'll have to do a whole nother series on the crack epidemic and and mass incarceration (laughs) from my point of view growing up in the Bay, circa 80s and the 90s. Oh my God. But anyway. These teenage or once teenage mothers who later became the sole providers of their house households or some people never some of those women never, you know, became employed. You know, you had um, the second probably the second generation coming up on government assistance. And like I said earlier, this assistance was really more to maintain you in poverty. You know, I put you into this, relegate you to this area of society called a housing project where you get subsidized housing. You make just enough to survive, but you're not going to get out. And I maintain the poverty in this section of our city. These people will not get out. You know, you think of Chicago, Cabrini Green, they look like prisons, some of the housing projects. Um, The ones out here looked a little bit nicer as they started to build them in the 60s. But, um, you know, some of these women never became employed and, you know, they were raising their children on their own. And then once again, we had the absentee father, you know, as we've seen in various stories of the struggles of black manhood in the United States, you know, from a raisin in the sun. And then you had a was that for color girls um, who considered uh, suicide when the rainbow wasn't enough you see these dynamics of black women um, being leveraged as the economic providers whether it's via the government or being you know employed in black men being disenfranchised whether they were coming home from the war um, or nobody wanted to hire them for various reasons this dynamic caused a lot of black men you know, to have very low self-esteem. And, you know, you had a second wave of the rhinos. We saw the wino rise after slavery. Well, nobody wanted to hire you and pay you when you were working for free. So we had a rise of vagrancy and people hanging out because because where do you go? You know, you're not given any resources to start a business and you're just here. So in the 80s, And in the 90s, you had a lot of absent fathers who just gave up um, in just the rage of trying to assert yourself as a man when another group of men controls society became overbearing and they just bounced, which left us to single mothers raising their children. And then you got a lot of the young men trying to find resources, which brought us to the gun violence. And so I'll never forget a conversation when I was having this discussion about elections and who you're voting for X, Y, and Z, a staunch Democrat baby boomer. She told me I voted for, you know, I was in support of the crime bill. It was so bad out here. We just wanted to do anything (laughs) to stop the gun violence but I she was like I didn't know you know it would have this effect but yes I supported it it was so bad now she is a staunch democrat to this day when you mention Trump it's just like oh my god you would have think thought that you know he lynched somebody and took a picture in front of it it's just like it's so crazy but it brings me back brings me to my point is that because and and it's not necessarily as Joe Biden said during his famous speech that the U.S. government did this to black people. They created all these situations that they knew would lead to chaos, offered no sort of assistance or really any solution to it, but that the crime bill and the lock everybody up was the only way. Well, for some of these baby boomer black women who, um 
you know, some of them lost control of their children, you know, or of their boys and who later became young men. And some people were actually in support of that bill. You know, the Democratic Party provided a solution for them. Or, if, you know, maybe it was a younger man who was funking with your son. You know, lock him up. And so the Democratic Party provided a solution for better or for worse. And it definitely was for worse. It may have seemed like better when you were getting some people who, you know, were causing trouble in doing all these things, basically terrorizing their neighborhoods, but the conditions, the systems, um, they knew that this was going to happen. And so that, that's my point number two, you know, for some of these women, especially the baby boomers, the, you know, Democratic Party helped to come in and fulfill a void, you know, when you don't have um, men in control of their neighborhood, you know, men are supposed to protect and keep things in order. You know, they provide discipline. And when you are the sole, you know, whether sole provider, whether managing government assistance, or you are a single employed mother, and you don't have any help, the Democratic Party subsidizes your life a little bit, whether it's with some sort of, you know, financial aid, some sort of a food subsidy like food stamps it was called back in the day or when all the men the young men not all of the young men but when a sizable portion an organized group of young men have decided to you know shoot each other and sell drugs and fall into these traps you know here comes the government to help you the democrat it was a democratic party and so that is why um some women of that generation, the Democratic Party, you know, and especially when you start talking and they have a real bitterness towards black men, the men abandoned them. They were on their own. It was the Democrats that came in. And so that's a whole nother conversation for another day. Don't y'all be coming for me in these comments. I'm just saying, I'm talking about the pathology, <laughs> you know, how they, um, why they're so loyal to this party from two different viewpoints um now obviously these women must realize that today is a new day you know what happened 30 40 years ago is past us the new issue of the day as we're all seeing they're calling it the border crisis it's really immigration um it's immigration and for us you know they used to call it the negro problem what are we going to do with the american negroes you know what is the united states where will their place be and so we now have an open border where all these people are coming in. And I'll do a whole separate thing about immigration, how it affects us, um, and really how it definitely does not help us. It never has, um, you know, since the inception of this country or really since the inception of the, the conquistadors came here, um, so it's a new day, but, you know, they're not tripping off of immigration like that because these older generations, the silent generations and the baby boomers, you know, they are living off of the safety net of previous generations. Some of the, you know, the safety net is what is called when, you know, you fail at some place in life and there is like this net to catch you from completely hitting the ground. <laughs> you know, it's like if you've ever jumped on a trampoline or something, you know, some people put like a net around it. I think that's to keep you from coming out. It might be. Yeah, I think that's what the net's for. But anyway, um, you know, it's a safety net to catch you when you fall. So examples of the safety net are uh, from previous generations that the baby boomers particularly have, you know, rolled themselves in. They done cut the safety net. They done made clothes out of it. <laughs> it's the reputation. It's our reputation as black people, you know, men and women. We have a reputation for being morally upright people, for being noble people. Um, for being hardworking people, for building the country, the creator of arts, all of these inventions. <clears throat> and for the most part, trying to love our neighbors as ourselves. And this older generation of people, <clears throat> respectfully, um, they've missed the mark. <laughs> but they are using the safety net to continue to get um, benefits really for their age group at this point. 
because of the safety net, net of reputation, you know, people are not challenging them. You know, for a long time, they haven't challenged them. You know, if an older black person says something, then it's just, you know, law, you can trust it. And so you have a, some of these older politicians like Maxine Waters um, and several other of them pushing these harmful agendas, but because they are wrapping themselves in the safety net of um, our reputation, um, our good name, you know, they get away with it. And then your everyday um, baby boomer, you know, got to use the reputation, you know, to get a job when they had the... The, the gates were open for everybody to come on through, you know, and take those opportunities because of our reputation and um, evidence as a people of um, being upright, hardworking people. And then, of course, the safety net of tangible inheritances. A lot of the baby boomers, you know, inherited the silence generation's life insurance. You know, they had, especially that older generation, they believed in life insurance, <laughs> And as their parents have transitioned on, they got cashed out <laughs> during their lifetime. They got to use their inheritances while they lived. Another thing I know, especially out here um, in the Bay Area and a couple of other, you know, people who were participating in the Great Migration when they left the South, a lot of them inherited land back in the South that they sold <laughs> over the years and were able to cash out. Out. And so those are safety nets that a lot of millennials and Gen X's will never see. It's gone. The safety net is gone. You know, life insurance, if you had a parent who was stable enough, you know, to invest in it and put you on the policy, you might get some. <laughs> um, or land, you know, if they didn't sell it um, or lose it by some other means of just not learning about the process um, and not knowing what to do with it you know, you may not have it. So, you know, the baby boomers are not tripping about things that are affecting us today because they're not in a competition for any anything. You know, they're trying to die a peaceful death. And, um, you know, a lot of them were expecting the Democrats to come on. You know, at least, you know, they keep talking about Social Security. Well, Joe Biden said bump your Social Security because he gave the Ukraine, he's making sure that he's paying the Ukrainian refugees Social Security. So I'm not certain how much longer those Social Security checks are going to last. So point being, um, when you see older black people and, you know, this is a blog about black women, you know, Try and get some understanding before, you know, you get lost <laughs> in the rage of the situation because I know it can be frustrating. I know during the election 2020, it was just like, I mean, you would have thought that Trump was just coming to kill us all. I mean, to office all, it was just the crazy, it was like a frenzy. They're in a frenzy. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that you have to put things in context. When they were coming up, this is all you know. You know, a lot of them are retired. They're not in the real world encountering all the new people who have just come here. And because they're elders now, a lot of the younger new people are not going to challenge them in their positionality. They're like, okay, they're older. We'll honor this group, but your kids are fair game. And so and because they've had the safety net, they don't understand what it's like to expect to have resources like the opportunity, you know, the ability to work and, you know, it'd be a reasonable process to get a job. Like they don't even, I mean, you could be in their era, you know, 60s and 70s, 80s, you can be rather, you know, you can have an entry level job and be able to afford a house and you didn't have to be the smartest person in the world, but, you know, there was something, a place for you and something to do. So, and then having all the safety nets, all these wealth transfers while you're alive, you know, that really helped a lot of people during all these transitions in the last 50 years or so. So you have to put things in context and be very wary. You know, let's not disrespect our elders. We're all going to be elders one day. And it really doesn't serve us any purpose at this point. You know, they believe what they believe. You know, my advice to you you know, in dealing with your elders is, you know, be wise, 
what you need to do for those who are just like is blo- vote blue no matter who is to work with them to make sure if they're your parents to secure your inheritance you know send them their articles about how millennials are struggling how the generations after them are having it so much harder i like to show my parents the ones of how the white people are living and more privileged groups are living and how they're struggling you know to invoke a bit more sympathy to show them because it's hard for them to contextualize it if they're not living it you know they go to the same places they're not having that many new experiences especially if they're not empathetic to really care like they don't (laughs) they really have it's hard for them to understand so the best thing you should do make sure that your inheritance is secure and they don't trick it off (laughs) if they haven't already and um keep pushing because one thing I will say that this administration has been an eye opener for everybody (laughs) I hope it has been I mean the complete disrespect um to black Americans from the Democratic Party has been absolutely atrocious (laughs) like it I mean it's a whole nother um conversation for a whole nother day but um oh the last thing I want to leave you with is that And this will be another post too, but you know, going into my next post, you know, we also have to realize and everything that I said that a lot of older black people are fighting ghosts, you know, they're fighting this phantom of the evil white man that has always been present or evil white women, evil white people, which yes, there are a lot of evil white people like let's not get it twisted the creation of white culture is rooted in anti-black terrorism um i mean it just is but they're really fighting the psychological thing like a lot of these older people voted really against trump um because they didn't want the white people's pick to win the white racist people because it's not just white people because most black people on a good day nobody really cares about white people like that (laughs) i mean most people before all this stuff started happening as far as you know the police murder excuse me i guess you can't say that but police unaliving people um in the street black people i don't recall all these conversations about white people i think this is an era where we're really having a conversation not just about white people but anti-black racism in general and so um a lot of them don't want white people to get rowdy and to cause them to have the effects of humiliation and shame that they may have suffered or they a lot of them did suffer it as a child that psychological trauma you know it's kind of like what MLK was talking about you know if you listen back at my last post when I read letter from Birmingham when he was in jail he was talking about the psychosis that happens when as he said you know a child has to start contorting their selves to fit you know this image of inferiority when you see signs saying you know you can't drink here you can't sit here no colors here no negroes there what that starts to do um in in developing an inferiority complex and a defeatist complex that you're not enough and how humiliating it is in indecent so as he said that he wanted to end indecency And so a lot of older black people are still fighting this psychological thing. It's just like they didn't want racist white people to win. So for them to be to make white people, racist white people feel a certain way, they would give up all of black America's (laughs) positionality, open the borders, do whatever, as long as these racist white people don't start getting like the Rebby boys and thinking they're so tough and disrespecting us. And even if they didn't disrespect us, for these older white people, just for a white person to think that they could was too much for them to bear. Psychologically, it was too much to bear. And they said, I am voting for against Trump because his base, a lot of them were talking about the people that supported him, the racist white people that we know are all up in the MAGA movement but (laughs) I always equate this thing that we live in the United States like a house 
you know, at this point, black people, we ain't in the house no more. We like in the backyard on the side porch. They on their way to kick us up out the gate. <laughs> but damn it, we still on this property. <laughs> and as long as we're on the property, <laughs> we need to continue to protect our interests. So regardless of how the racist white people who are in the master bedroom feel, we're still in this mug. And if we don't want to be off the property out into the wilderness with no resources to start and finish, it would behoove us to make sure that our gates are closed so that people who we know are trying to come in to kick us off the property and then erase our name off the deed so we don't inherit nothing and really erase us out of memory and just take everything that we collected we can deal with how a, a, the mass, the person in the master bedroom feels. Who cares if the person, the racist white people in the master bedroom don't like you? For the most part, they stay in the master bedroom. You don't even see them. You know, before this administration, I would say that we got kicked out of our room. We were sleeping on the couch. During this administration, we done got kicked out the house. <laughs> a bunch of people who are not heirs to this estate, are coming on in. They eating all the food that we done harvested in the backyard. You know, they eating our food for free, ain't put nothing on it. And we are on the side yard about to get kicked out of the gate all because black people wanted to hurt the racist white people living in the master bedroom feeling. Well, let me tell you something, black people. And I'm going to do a whole post about this. You better stop fighting ghosts. Because there are some real things having people in your physical presence that have said they're coming here to take. None of the people <laughs> coming across that border said anything about charity, trying to give to humanity, trying to be the best they could be. They said, I'm here to take. I want to transfer wealth, your wealth, onto my children. I want nice things and I want a better life. And you're sitting here worried about how the racist white people in the master bedroom feel about you while you were sleeping on the couch. We need to get our priorities straight and make sure that you're not fighting ghosts. But guard your energy and know that a lot of older black people are fighting ghosts. But you can fight ghosts when you've wrapped yourself up in the safety net. You can sit in you know, think on how things hurt your feelings when you are not out in the wilderness having to go fetch water, <laughs> okay, when you don't have to literally eat what you kill. And we're getting to a place where all of our feelings and how we feel about people, because when we really start to separate and rightly divide our experience, the racist white people, for the most part, stay away from us. They're not talking to us. And we jumped in the middle of a fight, a civil war between <laughs> new whites, old whites, and progressive whites. And in my upcoming videos, I'm going to be talking to you black women, to my sisters out there. Oh, it's about to get real. The backlash um, towards black women is coming so make sure that you subscribe to the channel like the video and let me know what you think about this in the comments have you talked to an older black woman that is not voting for biden i want to hear about that um how what did you think about this commentary were these some things that you've heard did you learn anything new and are you fighting ghosts were you one of the people that voted for joe biden because um you were like, I don't want the racist white people to feel a certain way. Be very careful trying to lord over feelings. What somebody feels about you is one thing. What somebody does to you is something else. Um, and we really need to get out of this thing with caring about what other people think. This is my last thought because, you know, I'll be going on. But um, this whole thing where we spend all day thinking about what somebody said... <laughs> You know, this sensationalism. Avoid sensationalism. Um, and that's my final comment. Thank you so much for listening. And have a nice day.